is so because only believers should be baptized with water that means babies should not be baptized so this catholic practice of sprinkling babies to add them into the catholic church we already showed that baptism does not add you to a church it's the baptism of the holy ghost that adds you to the body of christ um, but that's why we shouldn't be baptizing babies you know the reason why they baptize babies is because they think that baptism washes away sin so baptism washes away sin well we better baptize them as early as possible to wash away their sin but baptism doesn't wash away sin it doesn't add you to a physical church so we shouldn't be baptizing babies but not only that babies do not yet believe and that's what stops somebody from getting baptized as we saw in acts 8 37 and this is why baptism of babies should not be done at all and i do think that if a person you know let's say they're married to a greek orthodox person or a catholic person and just to keep peace in the family um, they get their children baptized i do believe that is a sin now i understand i have total compassion on why they want to keep family peace and and why they would be pressured into doing it but that does not justify them doing that if they do that they're in sin i understand why they're doing it if it's really hard on their situation but they are in sin it's always the best thing and always the right thing to to obey god um, and you'll always have the best outcome you know you may not have the faith to see how obeying god in any situation is the best outcome for your life but i guarantee you if you do the right thing if you obey god in your life it doesn't matter how you see the situation unfolding you know that will always be the best because not only are you obeying god you're pleasing god first and foremost you're doing what's right by you but you're also doing what's right by everybody else even though they don't even like it because you're showing them what is the right thing to do and you're taking a stand for the word of god and whether you see that or not you are actually doing what's best for them you are loving them because if you don't love them you'll just go along with their false practice and you won't stand up for what is right so it is a sin i believe for people to cave into family pressure and baptize their babies contrary to the word of god because we should obey god uh, rather than men but you just wonder it's so clear in the bible that we shouldn't be baptizing babies how do they how do they even justify baptizing a baby right don't you wonder like how do you justify baptizing a baby that doesn't believe you know they sprinkle as well and this is why protestant religions sprinkle because protestant religions are just half catholic they protested against the catholic church for maybe indulgences which is you know paying to get your sins paid out of hell and and all these things they didn't want to give money to the catholic church but they still wanted to keep a lot of the doctrines of the catholic church which is sprinkling and the you know the westminster confession baptizing babies you know work salvation calvinism whatever um, i actually i don't know where the catholics believe calvinism so let's just um take that one away um, but you know baptizing babies and sprinkling you know the anglican church does it the presbyterian church does it the methodist church does it um, you know the lutheran church does it so you just wonder where you know these protestants are so against catholicism you know why are they still sprinkling and baptizing their babies because they didn't get it all reformed remember the first sermon i preached you know sometimes to start something over you need to start again it's hard to reform something and that's what they wanted to do they wanted to get out of the catholic church but they wanted to try and reform it and that's why they still kept some of it that's why you see the government um, set up of a lot of protestant churches is like the catholic church you know they have voting and they have uh, uh, i don't know whether you've ever been to a protestant church I, because i i'm going back to my experience with the bible presbyterian church and it was really funny because every three years you would have to have elections right to elect your leaders and elect the deacons and elect elect the bishops now in this church we don't believe in elections because i don't believe in the sheep choosing the shepherd you know i believe that you know god ordains through the existing shepherds and the existing bishops it's a top-down ordination and you say well that's kind of corrupt because what if the bishops get corrupt and what if they just do whatever they want and do whatever they want with the money do whatever they want with the church well that's the same as like a husband doing whatever he wants in his family he has the accountability to god therefore he has the authority from god and therefore he will answer to god for the things he does now do i have in a sense absolute authority in this church i don't i have authority given by the word of god so i have to operate within the word of god but 
when it comes to making decisions in this church, I do have the authority because I ultimately am accountable to God for what this church does. So we can't just have everybody making decisions on what this church is going to do because you're not, in the end of the day, going to be accountable for what happens in this church. And I am, and that's why God gives me the authority. That's why God gives husbands the authority in, in a family because he is ultimately responsible to God for that family, not the wife. So if the wife messes up the family, the husband's going to take the brunt of it you know, from God, not the wife. And that's why God gives that authority to the husband. Sorry, a bit of a rabbit trail there. So how do, how do they even justify you know, <laughs> baptizing babies? Well, let me explain to you how they justify it. Colossians 2 verse 11. They take this verse here in verse 11 and 12 in Colossians 2. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we see there in verse 11 that Paul is writing about circumcision and us who believe are circumcised in Jesus Christ. This is not how they take it, but that's, how, that's what I believe about it. Then in verse 12 it says, Buried with him in baptism... Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, if we understand this passage in what we've learned so far about baptism, we can see that there are two separate things going on here. You've got the circumcision, which was a physical circumcision in the Old Testament, and in the, in the New Testament it's a spiritual circumcision with circumcision in Jesus Christ. That's how we are added to the people of God, just like you had to be circumcised in the Old Testament to join the nation of Israel. And then it says there what we read in Romans 6, that we are buried with him in baptism. So the Holy Ghost buries us with him in baptism, and one day we will be risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. But the way a Protestant will interpret that, they will say, look, see, there's a link between circumcision and baptism. And what this verse is actually teaching, and I don't know if you saw it when we were reading it, that baptism is actually the New Testament circumcision. So I don't know if you read that yourself and you get that. I guess they could try and read that into that verse and try and make a link there, but it's not clear at all. But that is where they springboard from their doctrine. They say, well, we're taught in the New Testament that baptism is the New Testament circumcision and babies were circumcised on the eighth day in the Old Testament and that's why we're going to baptize our babies because circumcision added you to God's people in the Old Testament and baptism, which doesn't, I don't believe that, but baptism adds you to God's people in the New Testament and that's why we need to baptize our babies, add them to the, to the church, add them to God's people. So you can see that they're wrong in a lot of different things because number one, baptism doesn't add you to God's people. Circumcision does add you to God's people, but we don't circumcise anymore. So it's the circumcision without hands, the spiritual circumcision that happens to us when we believe on Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ was circumcised. So when we believe on him, his righteousness is imputed to us. The things he did is imputed to us. So we are spiritually circumcised into God's people. Now baptism adds us into the body of Christ in the New Testament so, you know, it's all a spiritual uh, thing there. But you can see that they try and twist this verse to try and link baptism with circumcision. And then that's why they apply baptism to babies. But, you know, a couple of things that don't make sense that are inconsistent with that view is, number one, circumcision was only done to males. It wasn't done to females. But yet we baptize females, or they baptize female children and male children, don't they? They don't only baptize male children. Um, you know, circumcision adds you to the body of Christ, but baptism with water doesn't. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe they do. I don't know if they do this, but you know how circumcision happened on the eighth day that a baby was born. I don't know whether they follow that practice either, where they baptize children on the eighth day that, that they're born. So that's how they try and justify it. Uh, and a couple of other verses they try and turn to to justify it as well. Acts 16, uh, verse 13. These are the examples in the Bible that they love, that they try and say, look, you know, here's where a whole house was baptized, and therefore we should baptize our babies. Acts 16, verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household 
she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So they say, Ah, here's an example of a lady, Lydia, who believed and was baptized, and then she got her children baptized. Well, number one, it says, and her household. We don't even know if that included children, right? Because a household can include your manservants, your maidservants, and, and people, you know, maybe adult people in your house. But number two, it doesn't even mention, because they would just assume that they didn't believe, right? The household didn't believe. But we could equally assume that the household did believe. And I think that's the safer assumption because we have an example in the Bible, if we just read further down in the same chapter, of a whole house getting baptized and the whole house did believe. Uh, the Philippian jailer brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So there's the preaching not only to the jailer but also to his house. And he took them the same hour of the night. So everyone in the house that heard the word of God and were preached to them and washed their stripes. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's talking about he took down Paul and um, uh, Silas. I'm sorry, sorry, misread that. And he took um, them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So we see there that the jailer, yes, he did get his house all baptized, but all his house believed. So it would be safer to assume that with Lydia, that was the same case. If in the exact same chapter, we're given another example of a whole house being baptized with water, but the whole house believing. Um, just another question on who should be baptized and not baptizing babies. You know, you might be wondering, um, you know, what do I think about baby dedications? Because you know how a lot of churches these days will do a baby dedication. Now, I'm not against baby dedications. I do not plan on doing baby dedications because to me, I just think it's Baptist churches trying to do the Catholic um, tradition. You know, because the only, the only place we get it from is Catholics and Orthodoxes doing their, their baby baptism. And I think that that tradition has just sort of stuck that people want to do something when their baby is born. So then the Baptist response to that is, well, let's do a baby dedication where we basically do the exact same thing, but without the baptism. Um, so, you know, I just, you know, my personal conviction is because I know, well, because I believe that's where it comes from, I just don't want to have anything to do with it. And it's not something that we are ordained to do in the Bible anyway. So as a church, it's not really something I am that keen on trying to keep and trying to continue. So that's what I think about baby dedications.